Geometry, Chapter 1, Day 3. We're going to look at the length of a segment. We're going to look at the midpoint of a segment. So the midpoint of a se segment divides it into two congruent segments. So the figure might be AB. And we'll have a midpoint called point M. These two segments would there be, therefore be congruent. And we put a tick mark. So if you see a figure with these little dash marks on the segment, that tells you that they're the same length. So now for a notation, AM with a line over it is congruent to BM. We often like to use the endpoints to come first when we write out our statements. Here for bisect, it's very similar. If you know to bisect an object means to divide it into two congruent parts. We're going to have the same picture for this one also. We can call it X and Y if you wish. If you're going to bisect something, you're going to break it into two congruent parts. If you have a midpoint, you get two congruent parts. If you bisect something, you get two congruent parts. If you know a value is in between two endpoints, we do not know it cuts it in half. We just know it's in between there somewhere. But in this case, bisect means cuts it into two equal pieces so those two parts would have to be congruent to each other. A segment bisector is a point, like we've shown here. It could be a ray, it could be a line, a line segment, or even a plane that could cut it. So again, we're going to have a segment. We could call that DG. Then... If we're going to have a bisector, a bisector could be a point like that. It could be a line. It could be another segment. I'm going to make a line. So I know this is a line because it has arrows going to both directions. I'm going to put a tick mark on either one of those to indicate that those two are supposed to be the same length. And we'll label this point O. So now I know that DO is congruent to GO. Those are different ways to all represent the same concept. M is in the middle, Z is in a bisector, or it bisects the segment, and the line is a bisector. Distance formula. When we're using and trying to figure out the length of items, we can use what's called a distance formula. You subtract the x's and square it, add that to the y's subtracted and squared, and take the square root. If you look at that, it's actually the same thing as Pythagorean theorem. It's going to work every time. It's just all solved out for you with the square root and everything involved. So what is the length of RT? These are our two points. R and T. And we're going to find out the length. Here you cannot count it because it's not exactly horizontal. It's not vertical. So it's slanted. To figure out a slanted measurement, the only way we can do that is to use the distance formula. So our distance formula, we're going to look at this as X1 and Y1. This is X2 and Y2. Now we're going to use our formula. So RT is the value of negative 4 minus 3 squared and 3 minus 2 squared. That's using the formula. Negative 7 squared and 1 squared. That's 49 plus 1 
which is the square root of 50. If you have the square root of 50, square root of 50 could be broken down. One thing that we could call it, we could call it 2 times 25. And we know the square root of 25 is 5. So with the square root 2 still in there, that means the same thing as the square root of 50. Or if you want to use your calculator, you could have found out the square root of 50 is the same thing as 7.07. .07. At least approximately 7.07. .07. Next we're going to look at... the length of GH. So we could plot our points. There's G. There's H. Figure out what that length would be. Again, it's not horizontal, it's not vertical, so we can't count it. So we're going to use what's called the distance formula. We like to look at our points and label them x1, y1, x2, y2, and plug it into our formula. So we have gh is going to equal the square root of y2 minus y1. Notice I use parentheses there because the y1 is a negative, so a negative and a negative x2 minus a positive 5, doesn't need parentheses there. So then we might say that this is 6 plus 1. This would be negative 8. This would be 7 squared, which is 49. This would be negative 8 squared. When you square a negative, you get a positive. And 8 squared is 64. So this comes out to be 113. Well, 113 can't be broken down by another perfect square. 4 doesn't go into it. 9 doesn't go into it. 25 doesn't go into it evenly. So the best thing other than that is to use a calculator and show that this should equal approximately 10.6 units. Now with the second page for day three, chapter one, we're going to look at the length of JK. We're going to have these endpoints, but notice how the points, the coordinates, have letters involved. Makes it a bit trickier. We'll experience this later in the year also. But if you're going to find length, we're going to look at this in terms of the distance formula. So JK, if this was X1 and Y1, X2 and Y2, so you take your Y2 minus your Y1. Well, typically you start with x's. Let's start with x's, because that's the distance formula. x2 minus x1 plus y2 minus y1. We could call this negative c, 3c squared, plus 0 squared. So that's just here. You would take, you would square the negative, square the 3, square the C. Remember, you would square each part of the things that are inside the parentheses. Now, can you break this up into two equal pieces? 3 times 3 makes 9, so the square root of 9 is 3. C times C makes C squared, so the square root of C squared is C. So the square root of 9c squared is just 3c.
looking for the length of mi. Well, it's a length again. So whenever we find length, we're going to use the distance formula. 9d minus 5d, those are your x's squared, plus, since I started with the 9d, I have to start with just the d. Then I did the 5, so I'm going to work with the 2. Got to take the numbers in the same order. So 9d minus 5d is 4d squared negative 1d squared. When you square the 4, you get 16d squared. When you square a negative, you get a positive d squared. And we should be left with 17d squared. We don't know what the square root of 17 is. Because it's in a square root form, we don't want to use a decimal. But we do know what d squared is. So a lot of times we'll bring out the parts that we know. Because it's multiplication, we're allowed to break it apart. Next, we have already talked about the midpoint. We talked about a bisector, a segment bisector. Now, there are different ways that we could find them on a sheet of paper. If we have this segment, whatever length it is, we can find where that midpoint is. It would be somewhere around here. You might be able to estimate it pretty well, but if you really want to find it, one way to do it is to have your segment on your sheet of paper, fold your paper so that the ends, endpoints come together. You gotta be real careful to be accurate. Fold it, and you can find right where that midpoint would be located. So what you actually did, you creased the paper so you have a segment bisector, and it's going up and down. If you, if you did it correctly, that segment bisector should actually be a right angle to this segment. We'll talk about that in a later week. But there is a midpoint by folding the paper on top so point A touches point B. And you're going to find this new location called point M. It's the midpoint. So this segment is the same as that one. AM is congruent to BM. Here we'll look at a few examples. Here we're trying to figure out what the length of RS is. If you look at the picture, we have these tick marks. The tick marks indicate that they're both the same length. So using our segment addition postulate, we know that RS is going to be made up of the two small pieces, RT plus TS. We don't know what RS is, but we have 21.7 and we have 21.7. So if we add those together, we get 40, because 20 and 20, 42, 21 and 21, 1 1.4, so that's 43.4. That would be units, because we don't know if these are centimeters or what. Next, we're looking at a segment bisector. It's a ray. It's bisecting this. It's bisecting this segment. It's a ray because it has an endpoint that goes in one direction with an arrow. We're trying to find the length of A to B. I know that AB is made up of these two smaller pieces called AC and CB. AB is made up of two smaller pieces 
called AC and CB. I don't know what the whole thing is, but I know that AC is 2 and 1 quarter, which we could call that 2.25 if you wanted to. And we have this other value, which I don't know what it is. Except that the tick marks are the same. So I know that this is 2 and 1 fourth. So I can write in 2 and 1 fourth. So now I have that AB is equal to 4 and 2 fourths which we would often call four and one half. We like to label that with units. The last one. Here we see that C is the midpoint of the whole BD. We're gonna find the length of just one of those. So when we first start thinking about this, we think about the segment addition postulate. And the segment addition postulate would say that BD equals BC plus CD. In this case, to use the segment addition postulate, we really need to know what BD is. We don't know what the whole thing is. We can't just call the whole thing 5x plus 1. That's the sum of those two put together. But if we wrote all those numbers in, they'd cross each other out. So in this case, that won't work. That's not helpful. Okay, so here they tell us that C is the midpoint. So what does it mean to be a midpoint? To be a midpoint you're going to have two segments that are the same measurement to each other. You have B to C and you have C to D and they're the same measurement. In this case they like to call it 3x minus 2 and in this case they like to call it 2x plus 3. That's like having two different ways to get to 10. You can do it with two fives, or you can do it with ten singles. Two different ways, but they mean the same thing. Now we will subtract. We'll add the two to the other side. And we get that x equals five. Now if x equals five, and we have to figure out what bc is, BC is 3x minus 2. So that's 3 times 5 minus 2. 15 minus 2 is 13. That's 13 units. That's the answer.